time, but we are in the um, ninth chapter of Acts, and this, I keep, I was thinking today, oh man, this is such a significant chapter. This is such a pivotal point, and it is, but really chapters one through eight were two. <laughs> yeah. It's like every week we come in here and say how significant this is, and I, and, and why do you think that is? Why do you think that what we're studying, this particular part of the Word of God, why is it that literally every moment and every chapter is so significant? God's it's the beginning of the church. Right, you know? right. Um, and what were you saying, Cindy? I just said that I feel like God, each week, it, he's prepared me to get through whatever is going on this week. Oh, you know, with okay. the lesson. Yeah. Right. That's great. That's great. And that's what's amazing is like two years from now, you could pick this up again and it could be as, um, you know, just as amazing and significant um, that and, and play out a little bit differently to you um, then, you know, um, it could be that's what's relevant about it. And that's why we not why the word of God tells us, not just why I say, but the word of God tells us it's active and alive. Um, we know that the word is Jesus himself and he's active and alive, but we also know that these written words are more than just written words in the original language, not necessarily in bad translations of them. That's, that's <laughs> that verse that I was thinking while you were talking. This that yeah. verse. Good. I mean, that is why, you know, that's why study is so important. And that's why, um, I'm sorry, I'm adjusting, why it's important for us to stop and take the time to dig deep and to figure out what it is and what it says, but also don't leave it. Like Cindy was saying a minute ago, Cindy, you didn't say don't, you, Cindy was saying a minute ago that all of this has helped prepare her for her week, which means that she's applying it. And that's so it's significantly important is to take what you learn and don't just leave it there but to live it out and, and just ask God to help you and change you. And that, you know, prayer before you study is important. Prayer during study, prayer after study. Um, and I'm just in my personal reading, I'm going through right now, I'm in first Chronicles and many times in my journal, when I'm reading about the events and the lives and everything else, I'm saying, I don't understand. You know, I, I get the story. I can cognitively understand the story but I don't get like these choices some of them made <laughs> and even why sometimes there's not necessarily commentary about it. You know, there's not necessarily, um, you know, and you know, they got zapped by a bolt of lightning for that, you know? <laughs> um, sometimes I guess that would be significant and helpful for me. Okay. So let's look, we're going to go, I've got the, the paragraphs down. We're going to look, but we're also wanted to take some time and look at Saul and look at his life and put this together. So as we go through the first paragraph is verses one to nine in chapter nine, but let's think about where we are. We've got Jesus left. We've got the Holy spirit coming, the birth of the church. As we've already said, we have, uh, more and more believers being added. They, we've got them specifically in Jerusalem. And then we start seeing right around Jerusalem, people start coming because of what they're hearing. And then we have um, one time after another time after another time, especially the officials and the chief priests and all the elders that they are pulling the, like Peter and John in front of them, or eventually Stephen in front of them, um, in front of the council and they're on trial. And eventually, you know, and, and the outcome of each of these trials ten, is getting worse and worse. Like first it's just a finger in their face and then it's scourging and then it's later we know what happened to Stephen. And so tell me what happened to Stephen. Before you move on, can I ask, is anybody else's computer freezing up or is it just mine? Nobody else's? Mine? I think it, it's on my end then. Okay. Yeah, it could be potentially mine, but, um, and I don't know, I guess my I, I got a message. My internet is unstable, so it, okay. it must be my internet connection. Okay. Sorry. Well, that, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can watch the video later if you, if you feel like you need to um, catch up. But, so we have... Stephen being killed, stoned in particular, um, and we have an onlook, onlooker that is significant to this week. Who watched what happened to Stephen? Saul. 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 
Right. And then in the next chapter, the beginning of the chapter, it says uh, the commentary about his attitude towards Stephen Stoning was what? He approved. He approved of it. He heartily approved. He gave hearty, yeah. hearty approval to the putting him to death or hearty agreement to putting him to death. And as a result, or right after Stephen stoning, there's a significant change. What begins to happen to the church? They scattered. They scattered, they scattered. because of what? Because of the first. Persecution. Oh. persecution, right. So persecution begins. Um, up to this, there has been basically a very good attitude towards the church, and then maybe a, a standing over here, but not being upset by them. And then there's, uh, and, and really it's been centered around the council um, has taken action against the apostles. But now we're starting to see, in this case, Saul, but we're starting to see a persecution of the church. And you can imagine that the separation, that gap is gonna be widening with the onlookers, the people that are not believers, but maybe didn't have a problem with it, but now they're gonna possibly be taking sides. So Saul was literally going into homes and dragging people in Jerusalem to uh, prison. And then you see him again here in chapter nine. And what do we learn about Saul here in chapter nine? In verses one to nine, what do we learn? He was still threatening right. the disciples. Right, Saul was threatening. In fact, it says he was breathing threats and murder. Right, yeah. right. He was, yeah, he was huffing and puffing, wasn't he? Um, <laughs> and as a result, in other words, he has not slowed down. He has, <laughs> if anything, his, he's doing what? Accelerating it. Right. He's getting uh, more active. You can imagine it's kind of like it's being fed. You know, he's getting that feedback loop of this is this is fine and we we're, we're glad you're doing this um he's getting more in a sense more and more powerful in these verses verses one to nine who did he go to, who does he go to and why he goes to the high priest and right. i'm wondering if that was the same high priest who was in an office when jesus was crucified I would assume so, but um, that we don't, it doesn't name him, but I would assume so because we've just turned a page. I mean, you know, not much time has passed, um, but regardless, he's gone to, if, if it wasn't the high priest at that time, he would have been a chief priest. He would have been part of the council, even though, even if he wasn't the actual high priest at the time. So um, he goes to the high priest. What does he get from the high priest? Permission to kill. Okay. Letters. Put, put letters. Letters. Yeah. letters. Letters. Okay. So um, he goes to the high priest and he gets a he gets letters. Who yes. are the, who are these letters to? The synagogues at Damascus. Okay. Just tell me what a synagogue is. What group of people would be there? The Jews. Where is Damascus? Oh. It's in Syria. It's in Syria. It's not in Israel. Right. It's in Syria. That's a different country. Mm -hmm. Do you realize that Damascus is the oldest city of continual population in the world? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Wow. It's been continuously populated longer than any other city in the world to this day. Yeah. And then Kay gave you a fact about it and said that there's a street in it still named straight, mm -hmm. which is, we, I don't know if it's the same street, but I just think that's awesome. Um, but the, so he's going to the synagogues in Damascus. Where he wants to go to the synagogues and does. He goes, he wants to go to the synagogues in Damascus. So what would the letters from the high priest be about? Would the high priest have anything to do with that synagogue? Would he have he's over to? them. There you go. The high priest is over all of Judaism at the time. Okay. 
so the Jews in Damascus would listen to the high priest. So this is an official letter giving him official okay and approval, and he specifically wanted approval to drag back to Jerusalem bound anyone he found what? Belonging to the way. Right, belonging to the way. So this is the first time we see the way. Um, and it's official. It's, it's not just the way to, you know, lowercase letters. It's the way. You looked up this week. Why do you, what do you think is the way? Why do you think it's being used this way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the okay. Father except by me. Okay. So if there are any in the way in Damascus, um, how did they get there? When they oh. Probably from the scattering. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Or they came about even after, like some that left Jerusalem and went to Damascus. This is one of the places maybe they had gone. That'd be a long way to get to safety. And as they got there, they would have started teaching. Yes. So they they might have it might have not just been people from Jerusalem. It might have been people once the Jerusalem people got there, they got converted as a result. They could have come from Samaria because remember already uh, Stephen, not Stephen, uh, Philip and others had begun to teach outside of Jerusalem. Now, mm -hmm. Kate keeps pointing you back to Acts chapter one, verse eight, and Acts chapter three, verse I think it's twenty-eight. Why? What is she trying to keep you reminded of? Or it's a lay it's a layout geographically how the the word is gonna be the witnesses are going to go. Right. Um, Judea, Samaria, uh, yes. right. So this is right in Jerusalem, and then mm -hmm. Jerusalem is in the region of Judea. But it says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, which starts going a little further north, which would be the northern kingdom, essentially, and then to the uttermost parts of the world, right? Or the, uh, the, there's another place. And then it's, I think it's 2, chapter 2, verse 30. No, 2, where is it? That talks about, um, this is for, okay, it is 39. For the promises are for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. So chapter 1, verse 8, does what you're saying. It lays geographically out. Um, chapter 2, verse 39, talks in a, in a more general sense. But he's talking to the people in front of him. So it's for you and for your children and for those who are far off. And don't you think that's so comforting for those that were believers because they might have remembered where they said may their blood his blood be on me and my children I do and so there is this promise like it's for them too you didn't bring a curse that can't <laughs> can't be read yeah that's a good way of putting it because a couple of verses before it it says they were pierced to their hearts and said what can we do you know they were convicted because peter had just been saying you killed him and mm -hmm. they reacted to that so yeah i believe it brought great comfort it also brings comfort to the now which is we're some of the far offs mm -hmm. <laughs> right mm -hmm. um yeah. and so it's it is a it's a great that it's, so that's why we have we want to keep going back to that in our minds because as you did your um at a glance chart and you were looking at your um oh shoot my mind just blanked on me um you're looking at your segment divisions um she pointed out you know in the beginning the first chapters chapters one through seven they're in jerusalem and now we're starting in chapters eight and beyond to go into those other regions. But I wonder if in their mind, and it really doesn't matter because God, you know, I think to the ends of the earth and we think us, in their mind, I wonder if it was just like Rome or just, you know, they had a limited, I wonder if they had a limited vision of what the end of the earth would have meant. I, I think probably, I mean, 
for one thing, they didn't have the ability to kind of see around the world like we do today, mm -hmm. for one. But I think they also might have limited it to Jews. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Because they're talking to- At that time, yeah. yeah. He's talking to you and your children and those far off. Now, we saw last week, we looked last week at the history of Israel to know why Samaria was how Samaria was. And what we saw was in the, when the Northern Kingdom went into captivity into us, Syria, um, Northern, nor, North of the Northern Kingdom, um, Samaria was then, people were brought in from other countries because that's what those kingdoms did at that time. When they conquered one, they removed, and then they put some of the other conquered people in. And partly you can imagine if you got to stay in your country, like if somebody came and took over America right now, and we all got to stay in our homes and in our towns and in our cities, not a lot would change for us. And eventually we would have the wherewithal, the resources and the connections to possibly overthrow them. But if we were all removed, and taken to somewhere we did not know, where we did not have resources, where we did not have anything, and we were dependent, then, and we were scattered, maybe divided up, then we wouldn't have the wherewithal or the resources to overcome that government. So that was part of their strategy, and, and a lot of them did. Assyria did it, and Babylon did it, we know. Um, and. It was a way to decimate an area, a way to decimate people, but they didn't want to hold land and not have someone on it. So they would take some of the other conquered people and put them there. Um, because in, especially in that day, land that is abandoned is just gonna be taken over by animals and taken over by weeds and unproductive. They wanted it to be productive, but they wanted it to be productive with their slaves, with their you know, enslaved people. So that's why Samaria became mixed, um, mostly not Jews. Well, mm -hmm. the Northern Kingdom went into captivity and by and large, the Northern Kingdom never came back. Mm -hmm. When the Southern Kingdom was taken into captivity into Babylon, after 70 years of captivity, some, but not all, came back. So there's been a difference in those two kingdoms all of this time. And God has a plan. If you read Ezekiel, you'll see that God's going to bring it back together and God's going to restore them back to the land. And we've already seen that beginning to happen. They're now a nation and more and more are coming back, um, which is another historic thing. We've never seen a nation be completely conquered and completely gone and be restored mm -hmm. like Israel has been. Um, and God does that. Uh, which is incredible. But so you see a lot of thoughts and emotions here, but he's, Saul, is getting these letters, which is the official letter from the high priest to take to these synagogues, because can you imagine Saul showing up in this city that he is <laughs> not from and, and starting to arrest people? Do you think that the, the people of Damascus would have been okay with that? Do you think the Jewish community in Damascus would have been okay with that? No. Not without the letter. Yeah. Oh, okay. The letter gives him the authority to do this. Um, Even that, if they might have agreed, which I, I don't know that there's any evidence of that, but it would be like out of my hands. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it's somebody else. Right. Right. It, again, but just I don't know that they would have thought that way. Think about somebody coming to your town and just going to certain houses and dragging people away and you don't know why and one, one of the things you do know is they're like you so are you going to be next what's this about mm -hmm. why are they doing this um but he's making this distinction and he's searching for people that are part of the way um mm -hmm. we would call them part of the church mm -hmm. right but it's it's a movement it's uh, there somebody has defined it it's kind of like um i have said before i did not name myself a protestant think of the word protestant protester mm -hmm. yeah. okay i did not put that title on me but am i a protestant yeah by mm -hmm. the denomination i end up in or by basically not being catholic I, I, seriously um not trying to bash anything just saying i'm not catholic therefore i'm a protestant. Protestant. 
<laughs> I'm a protester. Yeah. So same way here. I don't know who named them the way they may have, or it might have been an outside group naming them that, but suddenly we see this, this word the way, and it comes up later. We'll see it later in the book of Acts, but he's looking for those people and he has an intent and he has the authority and he's on his way. What happens? Blinded. <laughs> he's blinded. Yeah. But blinded by the light, right? There's a song like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he meets, uh, my thing's going to, what meets is it? Jesus. Meets Jesus, right. Let's see if I can get a better, better point. He meets Jesus and he ends up blind. Um, and this is on the way to Damascus. Where does he end up? In the home of the, uh, um, in the, is it Ananias again or, or yes? Yeah. Uh, that's, not, that's not who he's staying with. Um, but at the end of verse nine, he's being led and he's in Damascus. Yeah. By the people he's with who heard the voice but did not see anything um and they stood speechless um and but okay we and we need to look for a second at what did jesus say to him why are you persecuting, are you persecuting me? me right we actually talked about this a little bit last week you looked it up though what is jesus saying by saying why are you persecuting me Whatever you're doing to them, you're doing to me. It referred us back to Jesus said, I'm in you, you're in me, I'm in the Father. You know, that whole. Yes. Whatever yes. you do to somebody else, you're doing it to Christ. Right. It's, you, it's whatever we're doing to one of his. Yes. If we're yes. doing to yes. his brethren, then, then he takes it personally. Um, now, for a second of application, what does that say okay. to you and me? He's the same thing for us. Right. That he, what I, th I thought of when we, that the, him standing yeah. at the throne is what I thought of when I was, mm -hmm. I was like that, he is standing there and seeing what they're doing to us. Right. And does not, he, he, it is to him. Yes. In the How do you make that distinction, though? Because I'm thinking, I, I've got to, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to understand it. Because he does say at some point, you know, whatever you do to the least of these. My brethren. Do me, the least does it say my brethren? My brethren. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so it's not just to anybody. It's right, not just right. to anybody. It's those that are in covenant with him. With him. Yep. Okay, I kind of struggle with that. I'll have and to. And that's okay. You can disagree with me on that. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> I mean, I'm, it's, not, it's not a hill that we need to die on, okay? I'm just saying that. I'm not disagreeing. I'm processing. Right. I just had to well, of it like that. In the passage of Matthew 25, when he's separating the sheep, sheep from the goats, which is a future thing. Right. Okay. This is a specific time that Jesus yeah. is going to do this. And I'd love to get into eschatology <laughs> and explain to you exactly when it is, because <laughs> I love that. But this is a future time when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats and he's, and he's basing it on their behavior. And he says to the sheep, when you visited me, Jesus, in prison, when you gave me food, when you gave me clothes, and they're like, when did we do that for you? In other words, they've not been around Jesus. They did not go to prison while he was in prison. They didn't go and bring him food or water or, or anything else. And so they're like, when did we do that? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, did it, you did it did to it me. me. Okay. And the opposite is true of the goats, when you didn't do it, when you didn't do it, when you didn't do it. And at the end of that, the sheep are called righteous and they enter into his kingdom. Those the are the judges of the nations, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. And the goats are going to eternal punishment. 
So, I mean, it is very clear cut, the difference. Now, many times that passage is taught or preached as to like what you and I should be doing. Now, I think it's a great guideline to see what you and I should be doing. All right. But for instance, when it says you visited them in prison, we're not necessarily saying you need to take up a prison ministry. Okay. Although that's a great thing. If God lays that on your heart, go for it. It's an awesome thing. But he's not talking about going to a prison and visiting prisoners. He's talking about when his brethren are in prison and you go and you care for them. So there's a little bit of a difference, slight difference. And when that's an interesting thing, just study it further. <laughs> and just hang on, just keep, keep thinking about it. And in Revelation, in her Revelation studies, I think, if I remember. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and I love Revelation. I, I, oh. But you're not, I don't want to, I don't, I don't, just real quick, but you're, you're not saying, are you, like, it's okay to do, to not give, you know, a non-believer. No, something. not necessarily. You're just saying those passages, are you saying we would look to other passages to? If you not do a prison ministry, a specific thing, but we are to show love. Yes. To I'm not saying not. I'm oh. not saying not. I'm saying the basis by which Jesus is judging the nations, as as uh, I heard somebody's voice saying this um, when it, Diane said it. When um, when Jesus is talking about the judging the nations then the criteria for that particular judgment is how they treated Jesus's people. Okay. For that okay. particular judgment. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just saying, don't take it so far out of context that you create a doctrine based on that. Yeah, no, specific judgment. You have to read the, yeah, you have to take it, like you're saying, you have to take it in context. Because that was okay. a judgment. Yeah. For a, said for a specific time. Right. After okay. Jesus returns fully to earth. Right. Thank you for taking that time because I was struggling with that last time. <laughs> okay. Um, but again, it's it's a it's not a bad criteria to understand and, and to maybe even if you have resources may and your resources are limited, then what is your priority for that resource? The brethren. The brethren. The brethren first yes as far as caring for needs okay so let, let's let it okay those are great Sorry. questions no and we but let's move to verses 10 through um 18 yeah 10 through 18 we've got Saul blind and he's in Damascus and now we have Ananias a disciple and we've seen this name before, but it's not the same person, because remember the other Ananias died. So this is not the Ananias of Ananias and Sapphira. So apparently it's just a name. Um, but he's called, Ananias is told by the Lord to do what? Go to, rise and go to Straight Street. Yes. The house of Judah and look for Saul. Right. Yes. So the house that that Saul is staying in is the house of men in Judah. And it's on this road straight. Um, and, and he says, inquired the house of Judas, not Judah, Judas, for a man uh, from Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Lots of details. And it tells us that Saul's praying. He's at this house and Ananias is sent there. But then we also see what does Ananias already know about Saul? Well, he's almost afraid because he knows Saul is, has been killing Christians. Yes. Um, and, and so there are times when people in scripture are asked to do something or told by an angel or told by the Lord himself to do something and they question it. And you can, you can tell by the response to them how their attitude is right? Mm -hmm. So sure. you've got uh, Zacharias, which is John the Baptist's dad, is in the temple, and the angel reveals to him that his wife is going to have a baby, and he questions it, and he is struck dumb. He can't speak until his son is born, until he names his son. 
um, because he questions. You've got almost exactly the same question coming out of the Virgin Mary when the angel appears to her and she's not struck dumb. So here you have Ananias asking questions and he's not rebuked. So these are okay, honest questions, right? I mean, he didn't, he didn't refuse them. Right. He didn't refuse them. So, you know, he's just questioning it. <laughs> right. Yes. He's just saying, wait a minute. I, I've heard about this guy. And really, if nothing else, it's preserved for us that Ananias knew what he was getting into. Right. So and it, God, God is calling him to go. And so he's told, told him to go to, to go to Saul. And we see, I'm just going to start writing some things about Saul. Um, he's praying as he waits. What else is Saul doing while he waits? Army. He's What's had that? a vision. He's fasting. Fasting, okay. Starving. Right? He's not eating or drinking. Somebody said he's had a vision. Says he's, verse 12 says he's seen a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Right. So, so during that time of Saul being blind and in Damascus and staying with Judas uh, before Ananias is sent. Now, let's just put it this way. God met him on the road. Jesus met him on the road. And it took a little bit of time for him to be, you know, carried or taken to Damascus, uh, led to Damascus, he could have had Ananias at that house. He could have led him to Ananias's house. Instead, God let him sit for three days. There's a lot going on in that three days, including a vision, fasting, and praying. Mm -hmm. That's that's what he's doing. Um, so, Ananias does ask, but then Ananias goes. And as Ananias goes, when he gets there, what does he do? He lays his hand, he lays hands on him and um, he calls him brother. Very good, yeah. So he lays hands. Calls him brother. And even though we we hear we see in verse eleven what is said to Ananias, there's also more that Ananias says when he gets to Paul. Like more, a little bit more of what he was told to do is revealed. Not just, I mean, because we see in verse fifteen, the Lord said to Ananias, "For he, the Saul, is what? What does he say about Saul? Chosen instrument. Yep, he's a chosen instrument. Chosen by who?" By God. Yeah, chosen by God. And to do what? To carry his name. Right. Before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. Yes. And it's very significant to remember that because you probably know some about Saul's life who later becomes Paul, but does he go to Gentiles? I wondered about that next comment. I don't remember ever reading that before where he says, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Yes. And um, I wonder how he, if he showed, if he was showing Paul that during those three days or so, during those three days, if he was giving him a vision of, of the suffering, I mean, he, cause we know he suffered physically and then he was in jail and you know, um, you're, you're pointing out, you know, a little bit about what we already know. We don't know it here in Acts yet, but we will. I mean, like personally, we do know a little bit about him and he does suffer. We know Paul suffers a lot. We know that he stands before the Gentiles, that he stands before kings, and he certainly speaks to the sons of Israel as well. He right. does all of this. So Ananias is being told this 
Saul has a vision and in, that we know of, and in his vision, he knows that this man's going to come lay hands on him, and he's going to regain his sight. Now, that would be kind of comforting in that three days to know that somebody's going to come and lay hands on you, and that right. as soon as you hear his name, you're going to know it's the person that God sent because his name was even given, um, and it says, um, but yeah, this, I, I didn't, yes, it's right there, Diane, that it says how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, something that we can take from this is, do we know how much we're going to suffer for Jesus? No. no. Do we know we're going to suffer? Yes, because he yeah. said, you reign with me, you're going to suffer with me. There you go. So even if, in, even in Paul's case, he may or may not have had the details, Ari, I bet he might. We don't necessarily have the details, but were we told? Can we see in scripture? Yeah. So when it happens, what is our tendency? To complain. I mean. <laughs> but we're also told that when we tell someone the gospel, the good news, what are we also supposed to tell them? The truth, this. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the comfort. And also that, that if there is, the, that at the same time, that we have a comforter living in us. Yes. So that if we do have to suffer physically or emotionally, whatever, however we have to suffer. Right. That we have the comforter there with us. Isn't it and, interesting that the Holy Spirit is, which is the gift of God, which is given at your spiritual birth that we've already seen in an amazing way when he came at Pentecost to that group of people is called the comforter. I love that right. you're, you're reminding us of that. You know, right. he is called the comforter. Um, there's a reason for that. The paraclete, you know, he, there's, he, he has various roles and one of them is to comfort. Um, but I just want to have it cemented in our heads, and this is one of those things we have to keep being reminded of, is part of our relationship with Jesus, part of our relationship as a Christian is that we will suffer. The more we identify ourselves with Christ, the more the world identifies us with Christ, what's going to happen? Persecuted. We're right. going to be hated. Or persecuted, you know, whatever that actually looks like. Here in America, it's been fairly comfortable. Until now. Oh, it's right. been worse, yes. But so far, I don't sit here thinking some thought police is going to come along and know that we're doing this Zoom call, and I got to worry that that knock's going to come at my door, and I'm going to be drug out, and whatever is going to happen to me. So far, that's not been our case. But it's happening so all over the world right now. Mm -hmm. I'm finding that my worldview is is coming up against the worldview of even really nice church, even some believers. Yeah. Who are so involved in social justice mm. and and instead of the word in their church you know i mean that it's that that it's um that it's it's not persecution but it's kind of causing it's causing a um friction that that surprises me right and i think and i don't know i don't know your details and you don't know my details some of no. you here know a few of mine but i agree with you i have I've had some horrible things said about me and to me in the church. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, it's totally based on, and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I've done everything right, no. but I'm saying I'm standing on the word of God. And, yeah. and when I'm standing on the word of God and that happens and the other times I'm just messing up, but when I'm standing on the word of God and it happens, I have faced that. I mean, I have sat across the desk from a pastor who had did a smear campaign against me and then my husband 
in our church and we ended up leaving. And, um, and I mean, he's, he was lying to our face, let alone lying behind our back. Um, and we left and he's, he got to continue. And he's, yes, thank you. he's still revered. You know, God has blessed, I had that same experience, but God has blessed me and I, but I stood firm on the word. And yeah, he's not, the pastor's no longer in that church, but. And we've got to be careful and, and we got to be careful over time, but we've also got to be careful that I, what a statement I make about myself is I can be right and I can be wrong in how I'm right. So I got to make sure I'm also right in how I'm right. <laughs> and we got to be yeah. careful that, that we're not purposely causing division or friction or bringing things on ourselves. But the other end of that is when the problems come, the people that want to be comfortable, don't want us rocking the boat and then they blame us when we get in trouble if you want to call it trouble um we're blamed because basically the the idea and the statement is you wouldn't be in trouble if you hadn't done something wrong um and i always go back to stephen the first martyr and paul look at all that happens we're going to see what all happens in paul's life and over and over and over um but you know I agree with you. I think that's the state of the church today is go along, get along, let's go all along. get along, and instead of standing on his word. Mm -hmm. So as we look at um, what happened, he lays hands on Saul. Saul regains his sight, which is like the minor part. Saul regains his sight. He does, and you've already, I think it was Diane that said, uh, he calls him brother, brother Saul. Um, and it says, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he's filled with the Holy Spirit also. That's, that's important, because what does that indicate about Saul? True conversion. Yeah. He's truly a Christian. At, immediately as he gains his sight, what is the first thing he does when he stands up? Says he arose, was baptized. Was baptized, right? Yes. Um, right. He goes straight to the synagogue, starts to preach. Well, it says, and now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. Now, that's what it says right here. But we also looked in various other scriptures and saw a little bit of the timeline of Paul's life, and so. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm not saying there's a contradiction. I'm saying that potentially there's a little bit of time insertion here, potentially, maybe. At this point, he was still in Damascus. I mean, that's where he was and for several days. But as far as um, he tells us in Galatians that he, he did not learn from men he, immediately, not immediately. He didn't learn from men. He went where? To Arabia. Arabia. Right. So he went to Arabia and who taught him? God. Jesus mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus himself taught Paul. This Saul, sorry, at this point, Saul. Um, and then after that, he came back to Damascus. And then after that, he went to Jerusalem. That's right. And he and he stayed for a short time with Peter, 15 days, I think it said. And, and he only saw one other apostle, James, which is the brother of Jesus, wrote the book of James. And, and then he went to Tarsus. Okay, so that's the reason I'm saying maybe right here is an insertion of three years. Okay, that's a maybe. I'm not dying on that hill either. But beyond that, you start, you do see Paul's pattern. You already start seeing it. First thing he does is, I mean, you think about it, what he was like before, very learned, very, I mean, you, you saw he's a Pharisee. You look these things up this week. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, he was zealous, right? Mm -hmm. Zealousness is what you can see throughout his life. It's just that he was zealously wrong, and now he's zealously right. 
as far as the truth of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? But he was so zealous for the law, he was willing to go after his fellow Jewish people and drag them off and breathing threats and murders. He took it very seriously. Yeah, it said he tried to destroy the church. He said that. Mm -hmm. It was his personal goal to try to destroy the church. Why is that? I mean, was he a hateful person? He thought he was doing it for God. He, he thought, thought very good. He thought he was doing it for God. He was zealous. And, mm -hmm. and he was, he was a religious zealot, but he was zealous. He really thought he was right. And what's amazing about this, just think about this for a second. Why didn't God just kill him? He knew he could use him. He said he was an instrument. Yeah. Yeah. He was a chosen instrument. Um, and, and all of that knowledge that Paul had, and he was trained by the best. And he was from Tarsus, which is in Cilicia, which is a Roman colony, not Jerusalem. That's not where Paul is from. Right. Okay. But he was in Jerusalem because he was being trained. He was being educated. And you'll see some of this, or you know this about his life. But he was, he was very knowledgeable. He could connect the dots for the Jews or for us. You, do you know what I mean by? Yes, after his conversion. Yes, At, yes, yes. Before his conversion, all of that knowledge didn't get him there. Mm -mm. But as soon as he was converted, all of that knowledge could do exactly what you're saying. Could connect and the, also, the dots. And also his life tells us what God can do with anyone. Yes, I mean, yes. Right. Well, and here's another interesting contrast with Peter and John facing the council. They're known to be what? In comparison to Saul, they're known to be uneducated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And God used them mightily and eloquently and brought it all around in their teaching and their, their understanding. And then mm -hmm. he takes Saul, who had all the knowledge in the world of Judaism, and was zealous for the law, no one, it seemed, was as strong in his understanding of the law as, as Saul was in this time. He was a leader among that, and none of that got him there. Kept all the traditions. It just yes. sounds like he just, he, 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 he didn't mess up any of the traditions. <laughs> right, he was definitely a Hebrew of Hebrews, and I mean, he calls himself that, there's a reason. And he was zealous, and you can just see the strength and this the zeal, and yet none of that penetrated his his soul and got him saved. None of it. Following the law didn't do it. Knowing the law didn't do it. Being a teacher of the law didn't do it. Being on the council in a Pharisee didn't do it. None of it. And I'm saying that because we all need to look at ourselves. Are we counting on anything else other than what Christ did and God calling us and choosing us and in faith we respond? The faith that God has to give us as a gift in order to respond. I didn't even have that. Mm -hmm. So we've got to keep that in mind. And so that is a picture here with Paul of religious, religiosity, uh, religion, steeped learning, strength, genealogy, being a holder of the stuff. Attending church every time the door is open. Right. Being carried in nine months before you were born. You know, <laughs> none of those things. Or somebody doing something to you or you going to a class. I mean, I'm telling my story. You know, all these things are none of that saved me. It took but, God Pulling the veil off of my eyes. The scales had to like go from scales. my eyes. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. The scales and and didn't necessarily some somebody didn't necessarily lay their hands on me, but there's nothing wrong with that part too. If you're in that situation, but um, and then God can use anybody. Mm -hmm. And so many times I've thought you're standing 
and you literally just take a step over a line just a progression and everything that god had for you before brought is brought into your converted life i mean we already put off the old man i'm not saying that i'm just saying who i am and who god made me can be brought in and changed to be used as a chosen mm -hmm. instrument just like Saul. Mm -hmm. and i have to remember that jesus says to count the cost a builder does not build a building without counting the cost jesus says so count the cost when you go into this life of christianity it comes with suffering and i'm not talking about suffering you bring on yourself and i'm not necessarily talking about health issues although it can be that i'm talking about persecution mm -hmm. and so you've probably heard it and many have said if you aren't being persecuted why is that maybe you're not teaching and speaking out okay let's move on to 19 to 22 you have we've already started talking about it he goes in in damascus he teaches what's the reaction of ultimately what is the reaction to paul's teaching saul's teaching sorry i keep saying Saul. people were doubtful that he was converted um, yeah people are still shocked and amazed uh, verse 21 says all that heard him uh, were amazed. Right. Um, so he too says, and I didn't know if these people were coming to Christ or not. They said it says he kept um, increasing in strength and confounding the Jews. That that goes into all the learning that he had. Right. He was confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So right. I don't know how he was proving. You know, I mean. It doesn't say I think it's the connecting of the dots, you know, and telling his own story. Right. Because if 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 Jesus lived, and I don't think they were doubting that part, and he was crucified, and they would have heard about that probably. So they're not doubting that part. Paul met him on the road. Saul, same Paul. Saul met him, a living and risen savior on the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's part of his proof, um, not to mention the fact that Paul changing so much that instead of now breathing threats and murders, yeah, he's completely changed his tune and he's preaching Jesus as the Christ. He can now, say, look at me, I'm an example. Exactly. What is your story? I mean, that's the only one you can tell. Right. Right? We can tell Paul's story, but our testimony is the story that we need to tell. What is God doing in your life? What has he done in the past? How, what, what is your conversion story? But what is it since? It's great to tell your conversion story, but how did he work in your life yesterday, today, this morning, right now, tomorrow, you know, or what's coming up? Just keep telling your story and, and it, it should be continually changing. So as a result though, in verses 23 to 25, there were those who wanted to have him killed, right? Yeah. I shouldn't say killed, they wanted to. And he got away. Um, this was one of the times he was let down by the basket. And then it says, um, he, then he came to Jerusalem. And what happened there? The disciple, he wanted to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and mm -hmm. didn't believe. Right. And ultimately, who takes him to the, to, who shows up? Barnabas. Barnabas. None of encouragement. None of encouragement. We know why he's called that. And what would be the significance? I mean, Barnabas is in Jerusalem. Barnabas is called the son of encouragement. Barnabas is the one that, that sold property and gave property and was the contrast to Ananias and Sapphira. So where the apostles are concerned, Barnabas is somebody they know and trust, right? Mm -hmm. So he knows about Saul. There's some confusion about Saul. So he takes Saul to the apostles for them to hear his story, for them to see him for themselves, for them to verify that Paul, Saul, is who Saul says he is, to help the people in Jerusalem to accept him. Do you see that happening here? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Do you see that so are, sometimes we need to be doing that? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, so are you saying it's a possibility that what we just read through this page on our <laughs> observation sheet could be three years? Yeah. I think I think really around like verse 18 and 19, around about I mean guess in verse 19, there's a period of time that he would have probably stayed in Damascus and may have started teaching in the synagogues, but I think it's then that he went away to Arabia for three years and then came back to Damascus. I think the plot to kill him possibly was after that, like when he came back and he was in Damascus. And then as a result of leaving Damascus, he goes to Jerusalem. And then in Jerusalem, that's when he stays with Peter, meets Peter, well, Barnabas eventually takes him. So we're not getting all of the story in one place, and that's very typical. It's a progressive revelation. We find it in different places. It's not contradictory, because if you do say, well, maybe there's three years in there, it fits. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like it's saying, oh my gosh, this is, this is wrong. You know, it didn't happen that way. Could he have stayed in Damascus and had this plot to kill him and then left for Arabia? Yeah. The three years could be inserted somewhere else. Could he have gone to Jerusalem and then to Arabia? But Paul specifically says he did not get, get teaching from men and he didn't yet go to Jerusalem. So somewhere between 19 and wherever, 26, I believe is that three years. Mm -hmm. Three years. Yeah. Okay. And then um, he, but he does come to Jerusalem. He does, is taken by Barnabas. We can be that person. We can be the person who speaks up for somebody or brings a great teacher into your your church or whatever. Speaks for someone and just gives them that. They're going to listen to you if they know you, but they may not know me. I mean, like if we were in a setting, they may not know me, but you could say, hey, I've listened to her and she's okay. I'll give her my thumbs up. Okay. And then in verse um, 31, stand alone, you have this significance af after the fact that Paul is, Saul is converted and Saul meets with the apostles and all of that. Then you have this period of what in the church? A scene. Right. Peace. There's a period of peace. Now, it's interesting because there's a period of peace, but then you've got all this opposition to Saul. Because even before that, it was saying the Hellenistic Jews are arguing with Saul and wanted to kill him. We've, we've seen a little bit about the Hellenistic Jews before. Remember the widows that weren't being fed, but that was within the church. So this is, these are, and, and Paul would have been considered a Hellenistic Jew. He was a Roman citizen. Um, so he was, and he wasn't originally from Jerusalem, but they're arguing with him and they were attempting to put him to death, but they sent him to Caesarea and to Tarsus. That would be when he went to home, went to his hometown. And then um, the church knew a time of peace from Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, it says. And uh, they were going about in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit and continued to increase. The church is growing. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we shift to Peter. And we don't have any time. So we're just going to very quickly go over what's, yeah, we've gone over, um, go over what's going on with Peter. Um, Peter is doing what? Where's Peter? He, he's came down to, it just says he's traveling. I guess he's preaching as he's trying, you know. We would assume that, yes. It says he travels through all those parts um, and the parts I assume are the Judea, Galilee, and Samaria that they were talking about. And we know we've seen him before going to Samaria and coming back to Jerusalem. So he's traveling some and he comes down to a place called Lydda. And Lydda mm -hmm. is in the region of Judea. Of Judea. Um, and he does a couple of things in this area, Lydda and Sharon, <laughs> and then eventually he ends up in Joppa. So um, what does Peter do while he's there? Healed. Right. First, he heals a man that's been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. And the disciples in a nearby town of Joppa hear about it and send for Peter because this woman named Tabitha, it, who's called Dorcas in Greek, and we've got two ladies on here in the Dorcas ministry. A lot of, of women use this for this reason. If you didn't know the name, here, here you go. 
Mm. And she was very well known for her kindness and her charity and the garments that she made apparently to give away and to help people out. Um, but she fell sick and died and they laid her in the upper room. Now this is not the same upper room of, this is just a typical arrangement of these homes during this day, but she was laid out in the upper room after they washed her body. Peter comes, he sees them weeping, sees them mourning, he sends them out, he goes up and what does Peter do? Pray. He prays. Yes, he prays. And he kneels down and he prays, and then he turns to the body and says, Tabitha, arise. Um, and she opened her eyes, she saw Peter, she sat up, he gave her his hand, he raised her up, he called the saints and the widows, and he presented her alive. And it became known all over Joppa, many believed in the Lord as a result. So is Peter just like magical? Or is there a purpose behind what he's doing? Well, there's a purpose. God is using these signs and wonders, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, he's used them before. He's using them still. Um, obviously, this is getting attention, not for Peter, because Peter's giving the glory. He, you know, even in the, uh, he said, in the name, like Jesus Christ heals you, talking to the, and, and whatever that guy's name is, <laughs> Aeneas or whatever his name is. Um, but in the name, in Tabitha's case, he prays. So don't ever think that Peter just goes around yeah. zapping people. Mm -hmm. It's always within yeah. the gods. Because you can mm -hmm. you imagine in the townships areas of Lydda and Sharon, there's only one person that need to be healed. There's only one yeah. person we know about. Mm -hmm. And then a dead person in Joppa and Peter goes and prays. And as a result, tells her to arise. So he's being led by mm -hmm. the spirit to do these things. Yeah. So, um, and he stays with a certain tanner named Simon, and we're going to leave him there for now. We'll get back with him next week, and another very significant thing's going to happen. Um, I love these things. But keep in mind, I love your questions. I love your thinking. Um, notice that some of the things that we're saying are we're trying to reason through, but not necessarily, you know, know for certain. We know some things for certain. We're reading things here and we're trying to put them in perspective and place. But the main thing is who is Saul? What's going on? How is God using him? And how does it apply to you? How does it apply to me? But how does it apply to you? And that is there anything that you can, that you can take from this? You know, what, in Paul's, in Saul's life, or in all of these chapters, um, I mean, Cindy said earlier, it seems to be preparing her for what's going on this week, you know, or last, you know, each week. Um, it, it's pertinent. Um, when we look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, God's desire is for the gospel to go to the uttermost parts of the world. He's mm -hmm. not just concerned with one race and what we call race. He is concerned with one race, which is the human race. Right. We're only ever to consider people part of one race. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. there's different nations, and there's different tongues, and there's different boundaries that God himself has something to do with, and he even divides people into Jew and Gentile, um, and yet we're seeing here that he's starting to move them outside of the boundaries of Israel and into Damascus, in this case, as far as Damascus. You, can you imagine when Paul went to Tarsus, do you think he sat there on his hands and said nothing? So Paul's already gone to Cilicia or to Tarsus in Cilicia. Um, so, and also I want you to notice when you study Saul's life, Saul Paul's life, how much time? We want to be used like this. Yeah. But God taught him, basically put him in seminary for three years. And Jesus himself taught him. Mm -hmm. So whenever you read Paul's writing, remember, he was taught by Jesus. Mm -hmm. He was not taught, not that he never heard from people, but his training came straight from Jesus himself, just like the 12 that followed Jesus, the 11 that were left, so. You mentioned uh, what was Peter doing, and um, I made note um, that 
in verse 15, um, it says, it said, I mean, verse um, 35, it said, all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. So I think it was probably a, maybe a small rural, rural area. Right. I mean, he, he must have had a very dynamic and oh, he was preaching a lot. Yes. Because, because it says they all turned to the Lord. Right. And especially when you look at Joppa and it says many believed. So, right. yeah, I mean, I think all means all. <laughs> and I think yeah. many means many. But yeah. 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 And, so. and it, it also shows that there's nothing, the same person is speaking. And the same person, we've, we hear Peter's words prior to this. So can, we can imagine the type of message that Peter's preaching. But not everyone receives it. Mm -hmm. Right right? There's nothing right. wrong with the message. It's just like in the sower of the seeds analogy, the sower is, there's nothing wrong that the sower is going from soil to soil to soil. There's nothing wrong with the seed. It's not that some seeds better than others. The seed is the word. It's being spread. It's being broadcast. It's the receiving of it. And it's the doing of it, the, you know, the, what you do with it, the soil being the dark, the hard packed or the rocky or the thorn weedy or the good soil that God has tilled and turned. So over and over and over through scripture, we've got to keep in mind that the reaction or the response that we get isn't necessarily an indicator of whether or not we did it right or well. It's more about, I mean, we can do it a lousy job. And God, if we're to tell the truth, you know, we can, we can deliver it horribly. Like we can be, if you ever have heard about uh, Jonathan Edwards and the, the, the preaching of the great awakening, when he gave the message of the sinners in the hands of an angry God, they said he literally read it like this without looking up in a monotone voice. And he literally fell out of their seating in conviction mm. when god decides to move it can be a light shining down from heaven knocking you to the ground and blinding you so that you'll stop and listen or it can be a still small voice he has to unveil though no matter how much education and knowledge background events have happened in your life no matter your genealogy, no matter your heritage, nothing matters in that sense. But God choosing you before the foundation of the world and in time and in the time that he has chosen, unveiling it, unveiling your brain, heart, and gifting you with the gift of grace, the grace gift of faith. So that you can then act on it and receive. So I know it's incredible. Okay, we're going to end. I'm going to pray, and then those that can stay, we'll do the video in just a second. Um, I'm looking at time. It's like 1:13, so about 1:15, 1 1:16. 1 I'll start the video. Can give you time to go to the bathroom. I know it's quick, but kind heavenly Father, we praise you. We praise you for this message. We praise you for these chapters. We pray for, praise you more than anything for these events. We ask, though, Father, that you will lay them in our hearts and cause us to have the courage, to have the wherewithal, to be a Saul, Paul, in this world, that we have an understanding, even if we don't know details, that, that if we are doing the right thing, the world's going to hate us. And as a result, we're going to face persecution. We may face loss of people from our lives. We may be hurt. We may be pushed out. And we just ask, Father, that you help us remember this so quickly that we can turn back to you and recognize it for what it is. But it still hurts, and you know that, because you faced it yourself. You know it better than we do. We ask that you give us the strength and make us bold and confident and knowing what we face, that we will continue to preach the word in season and out, whether it's convenient or not, whether it's accepted or not, and whether we're accepted or not. We thank you for this reminder. We ask for the strength and the courage. We ask for it all in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen.